You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another very special episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul. And my name is Rob. Thank you guys for being with us today for this episode number 862. I like what we're going to be going into today. I think it's uh, it's kind of fun stuff and going to be talking about some stuff that would be really cool for you to do for your clients with 3D modeling and so forth. So it should be fun. It should actually be very fun. I'm very excited about this. So let's uh, let's get into it. Yeah, let's get into it. And before we do... Boy, we're going to just jump right into it. That's unlike us. But anyways, that's okay. It's okay. We do want to talk about our friends at coloradodronechargers.com. Awesome, guys. Johnny is just amazing. By the way, he provided all the prizes for the winners at the 2018 Drone You Fly-In, and we appreciate that so very, very much, making chargers for pretty much all the DJI stuff that you need and others that some of you might have. I think there's some unique chargers in there. Um The Mavic 2 Pro chargers will be coming out here in the next few months. I know they're working on that. So check them out, coloradodronechargers.com. Awesome folks. Also, yeah, they are incredible, guys. Johnny up there is an amazing guy and has been extremely supportive of drone pilots near and far. So check them out, coloradodronechargers.com. Also, today's question is brought to you by the Drone U community. If you're about to take your recurrency exam for Part 107, then you're going to love my upcoming series on how to renew your Part 107 license, which isn't really a license, it's a certificate, but you know what I mean. So what we're going to be doing is, if you notice for a while, I was actually asking questions on the show to remind everyone of questions, um, and someone wrote in and said, you know, I really appreciated that. Will you keep doing it? So we're going to keep doing it. So here's your question. For today, we will answer the question after we listen to our (laughs) question for the show to keep you in suspense, all right? All right, so the question is, to avoid a possible collision with a manned airplane, you estimate that your small unmanned aircraft climbed to an altitude greater than 600 feet AGL. To whom must you report the deviation? Air traffic control? the National Transportation Safety Board, or upon request of the Federal Aviation Administration? The answer, coming up. G'day guys, this is Dave out of Sydney. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say, wish I could make the fly and looks like a lot of fun. Got a few gigs on, can't make it out, but looking forward to seeing some stuff pop up on the Facebook page of the uh, shenanigans you guys get up to. So my question is, can you do 3D modeling indoors without GPS? So I've got a client who makes these massive stands for these big expos and trade shows. So they could be a few hundred grand for each stand. So they're pretty big. And I've been creating some marketing videos for them using drone footage and conventional footage as well. And I was thinking as a value add, I could also offer them a 3D model of that stand to give their clients a uh, pretty cool perspective of uh, what they can expect. So I just wanted to see if you guys have heard or done anything like this before. Cheers. Great question. So do you want to know the answer to the part 107 question first? Do you want to guess it? I was not listening. Really? All right, I'll ask one more time so everyone knows. To avoid a possible collision with a manned airplane, you estimate that your small unmanned aircraft climbed to an altitude greater than 600 feet AGL. To whom must you report the deviation? Air traffic control, NTSB, upon request of the FAA. Number one, I don't understand that upon request of the FAA. So that's suggesting that you wouldn't report it to them unless they requested? That's correct. Huh. I don't know. I would say ATC. Well, unfortunately, you would be wrong. The answer is upon request of the FAA. Because so basically, if they ask, so they're going to go to all the pilots and say, have you ever, or how is that going to go down? I don't so even So the explanation that. is each remote pilot in command who deviates from a rule in Part 107 must, upon request of the FAA administrator, send a written report of that deviation to the administrator. The reference is 14 CFR 107.21. Interesting. So the, that request could come because ATC saw it. Right. So um, potentially, yes. I mean, there's just too much going on for the FAA to be making those kind of requests. That's why that that's just sounds odd to me. But 
hey, it's the test. Remember, it's what you should know, know. what you need to know, and what you don't need to know. That's true. I'm way overthinking it. That's the answer. So <laughs> That's how most people do it. All right. <laughs> let's talk about today's question um, from Australia. By the way, thank you so much for listening all the way from down under. She's probably going to hate that I said that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would go easy here because his accent's obviously pretty rad. Yeah, so. his accent is awesome. <laughs> Mine, not so much. Um, all right. So interior mapping, is it possible? So just to be 100%, we actually have a class coming up on uh, matching interiors and exteriors together using something like PIX4D. Um, one of our students who's now an instructor uh, did so, so well. He won... Uh, sketch fabs like highlighted models because it was so good but um, considering modeling interiors this is actually something that I've been looking at significantly because I've been wanting to develop a program that essentially you could pull up on your phone see a 3d model um, see a video and then move into the model like uh, as an interior mm. and I actually did some research about different systems that are available just outside of just using a camera and a very wide open lens and using photogrammetry. So to preface this all, you can do interior mapping with photogrammetry, but there are other systems that utilize photogrammetry and LIDAR together to make much more beautiful interior floor plans and virtual tours and maps essentially or models of these places. So I know your wife is in real estate. Have you ever heard of Matterport before? Of course, indeed. So Matterport, in my opinion, is actually like the best solution for interior mapping and modeling. I'm actually paying to rent one next Thursday, and we're going to be uh, modeling. I can't say whose house it is because it's a celebrity's house, um, but we're going to be modeling a celebrity's house in Santa Fe to kind of showcase the ultimate mapping drone and interior mapping with nice. this and mixing them together. So anyway, long story short, Matterport utilizes a $5,000 system. It's so expensive, but it is the best by far. And it's a camera. Actually, the camera looks a lot like that light, Rob. It's about, you know, yay big. Mm -hmm. It looks like a newer LED light, essentially. And it utilizes, like I said, uh, multiple passive and active camera systems or, well, they're not really camera systems, but sensor systems to acquire this data. And what it does is you actually send all that data up to Matterport and they send you back with a link that you can actually view um, the model. Now, can you take any measurements from that model? Mm, doubtful. I I have no idea if you really can or not. I've never seen a way to do that. I would be fascinated if you could. Yeah, because that could be really useful. I mean, you could have the model and obviously, if, for example, if you want to see how it will fit in your space, mm -hmm. for example, using the models that he's talking about creating, that could actually be a really useful element of what he's trying to do, Yeah, what the would measurement be, part. Yeah, what would be really cool is that if uh, Matterport outputted like a DBX file or like a, um, a file that's like for AutoCAD so we could do a floor plan mm -hmm. and then people could then take that floor plan and like upload it into like an interior design application and now they can put their furniture that they know the sizes of to see if it would fit on different walls and whatnot. Right, yeah. I mean, I could go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, no, um, great stuff. Yeah, um, but, you know, can you do this with photogrammetry as well is kind of the question. And if you have a good interior camera, I would recommend also one that's typically stabilized. Because remember, guys, whenever you're mapping that, there, there are variables in the roll, pitch, and yaw of the camera. And if you essentially go outside of those variables, your data is not going to be optimized to get a good map or model output. So it's really important. So if you, um, let me actually send, I got to send this link to Rob really quick. I'm going to add a link into the bottom of the show so you can check out the report and findings yourself. But Pix4D has an entire report on data acquisition for indoor mapping. And they talk about the different methods that they essentially tried in order to do interior mapping. And then they also utilize, you know, interior ground control points. So they're not really ground control points. They're now wall control points. And then, you know, tried to measure the interior square footage with a total station versus utilizing photogrammetry. And the results are actually pretty fascinating. So in the main room, the total station uh, measured an area of 19.306 meters squared, where the photogrammetry in PIX4D measured an area of 19.435 meters squared, or a difference of 
0.129 meters squared. In another room, uh, so they, there's three different examples here. Total station square area is 9.521 meters squared versus the photogrammetry of 9.615 meters squared or a difference of 0.094 meters squared. That's pretty sick. I think that's pretty legit. Now, in these different methods that they tried, uh, they had the first method of acquiring data was their back against the wall, shooting at essentially 90 degrees offset from the wall. So imagine if you had, have you ever used, Rob, like have you ever done any framing and had like a framing square or a framing triangle? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what you would want to do as far as your camera angle when you're against the wall is imagine that you're, you know, a perfect 90 degrees off the wall. And then with this method, they, you know, tried to map a hallway and they said 126 images were taken and analyzed. Using this method, the matches in PIX4D Mapper were the most numerous and well distributed. Moreover, there was less reprojection error of 0 0.2708 pixels than all the other methods combined. So essentially, your back is always to the wall and you are taking images, you know, along the wall. Here's the thing, the really key point in getting good data is that they said in order to obtain precise measurement of the reconstructed result, it is very important to assign correct scales under non-geolocated situations. So he was asking the question, can I do this in a GPS negative environment? And the mm -hmm. answer is yes. Hmm. Mosini placed targets on the walls, making sure the scales were given in two perpendicular directions to ensure the scale is correct in all directions. Four control points with local coordinates were placed around the room and five checkpoints were assessed as follows. Accuracy of the entire reconstruction is not as consistent as outdoor cases. However, by assigning the correct scale of the project, general measurements could get more precise. Hmm. And then they showcase how they actually did a floor plan of a room. The fact that they do have ground control points with known GPS information, that's really interesting to me. Because notice they say that, like, look four control points with local coordinates. Mm -hmm. So they have figured it out. So they were, were probably taking coordinates on like the outside walls and then, you know, use, utilizing that. Lasers or I'm something? I'm glad that you brought that up on your computer. I don't know how to pronounce it, but them and one other group, um, like... You, so you've heard of them. Yeah, I've heard of them. They want to sponsor the show. So. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Maybe I should... <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering if you've heard of them because it applies to what we're talking about. No, it is really interesting. I heard of one other group, and maybe it's not the same group, but I heard of one other group that would send you a laser scanner for your iPad and a camera and sh show you how to take pictures in a very specific way. Huh. And then they would process the model for you and output a virtual tour. The only thing is, is when I looked in compared to those solutions to Matterport, it seemed like Matterport's uh, interactive experience was um, a little bit more convenient. Well, they, the way they describe it is it integrates with Matterport. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. I do so not know of that. We have more to talk about with this, but yeah. I just kind of wanted to bring it to your attention as no, I, we're talking you gotta about you got to tell this. me people who want to sponsor the show because well, I, I only want to sponsor people who like are, are genuine and authentic. We're having a little business conversation now. <laughs> 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 I do tell you. At the appropriate time. This is brand new. So anyways, carry he on. He never tells me anything. If you were wondering, it's just, it's never. So <laughs> We're in a fight. If, if, it's, if it's business related, <laughs> nope. Nope, 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 nope. Not, Stay away from not Paul. Not true, not true. His so. heart's on his sleeve. Don't tell him. <laughs> um, so anyway, long story short, if he's trying to do uh, interactive models, the other thing that he can do is utilize his models in something like Unity 3D, which is more of a mapping generator for visually stimulating imagery like games. So that's another option for you. I'm going to go back to this. I've done all this research because I want to develop a interactive mapping system. And what I've found is it seems like it's just a hundred times easier to use like a Matterport system, but it looks like this other group, Kulala. Kula? Kula could be another example, but I don't know. They are. We'll I, dig into it. Yeah. I don't know about them just yet. So... But we'll this is exciting. It. I love these questions. I really do because there are so many opportunities in this drone world. And it's really all about how can you provide a creative solution that actually saves money to someone or provides a marketing solution to someone. Which is exactly how he's thinking, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. This is definitely a, a fun show. Uh, if you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. We would greatly appreciate that. Leave us a review. I'm loving the increase in reviews. It really helps other people find the show. And I, I'm really thankful that you're here listening to us. If you have any suggestions for the show, like someone suggested, why 
why not have more commercial operators on the show to discuss their real world practical uses of drones? Well, we're going to do just that. So stay tuned for that and so much more. Also, good news. um, We've got a couple more uh, courses coming out. We're going to do a fresh updated don't crash course for all the new drones that are just popping on out. On top of that, we've got new surveying class coming out and the business course is here. First phase of it anyways, yes, yeah, so which we're tell, real excited so about. So for everyone who's been really stoked about the business course, how is it going to be rolled out? Well, I think it'll probably, and I say probably because we're still kind of figuring out how it's going to go with editing and what's going to come out when, but it's looking like it's going to be three phases is probably how I would mm-hmm. couch it at this point. First phase is getting very, very close, and that's a lot of the introduction to starting a business, um, introduction to the whole course. As a matter of fact, um, some financial considerations, a lot of kind of the guts of things that people need to think about when they're getting ready to start their drone business. And I think it could be useful for people that have already started to kind of go back and watch and listen and just make sure that they're on the right track with what they've already done. So if you've already started, that doesn't mean it won't be useful to you. And when I say it, I'm talking about the first phase. And then the next phase will come out soon, and there's going to be just deeper information on things like taxes, operations, um, marketing, those kinds of things are going to be coming out here real soon as well. You've gone in real deep into operations and equipment and just a lot of kind of in-depth information that we want to get out to people to help them have a successful business. So it's exciting stuff. Yeah, you got to think about workflow. You got to think about systems. There's there's so much. One question I have, and I don't know if we've done this, and I know that we're planning on doing it, but are we going to have information like about softwares that people can run their business off of, like things like Zoho, things like uh, oh, what's the other one that's it's being advertised all over CNBC right now? I forget the name of it. Um, it's it's. A weird name, but... Depends on, are you talking specifically for what element of business? Well, see, that's the interesting part is that these guys claim that you can run all of the different elements off of their one platform, Mm -hmm. and I haven't tried it. I was thinking about trying it to run everything on Ride Media to give people insight, like, okay, you know, I tried this and I tried that, because right now, just to be 100% honest, I run everything from Square and, um, what is the uh, other one? Square and QuickBooks, the little QuickBooks app. Yeah. So, you know, I I don't know. I mean, I'd have to look into those. My hunch is that anytime an organization like that, they're they're well-meaning, obviously, and the business model isn't bad per se, but anytime someone tries to be all things to all people, that doesn't generally work out well, I don't think. So I would think that you're typically right about that. My hunch is that what would happen is somebody would pay for that, which is probably going to be more expensive, and they would end up using bits and pieces of it, but not necessarily all of it, particularly unless it's geared specifically towards the the UAV industry, which is fairly unique in many respects. Um, Although there are a lot of commonalities between a, a UAV business and any business, obviously. But I don't know. We need to look into that. Currently that kind of macro solution has not been evaluated in the business course. Um, Maybe we should. But we can can look into it. That could be a good webinar. Totally. You know what I mean? All right. Well, until next time, friends and family, uh, thank you so much for listening into another episode of Ask Drone You. Don't forget to bring in your questions. Go to askdroneyou.com because we'll answer them, believe it or not. Thanks again for listening. My name is Paul. I'm Rob. This is Ask Drone You. (laughs) 